Hi everyone, I'm Alba. I'm a PhD student in Groningen, the Netherlands. Today I'm going to talk about a recent work on constraining Pramodian on Gaussianity. I will try to answer the question, how are constraints on Pramodian on Gaussianity going to improve with resolution? First of all, I will give a brief introduction on Pramodian fluctuations and on what motivates us to study non Gaussianity. Then I'll show you how we count information and how the nature of tracers affects it, tracers as, as the CMB, the cosmic microwave background. Finally, I'll discuss some results where we see that certain kinematical limits of cosmological correlators come in handy. Currently, cosmic inflation is the main paradigm that explains the generation of primordial curvature fluctuations. As the universe expands, Quantum fluctuations in, in, in the inflaton field are stretched to cosmic scales, inducing curvature perturbations. These are the seeds of the large scale structures we observe today. An important window that we have into the early universe is the CMB radiation, whose anisotropies in temperature and polarization reflect the primordial lens. The special correlations between anisotropies provide crucial information about what happened in the first moments of our universe. So we're interested in characterizing the statistics of fluctuations. In particular, if these are generated by a Gaussian process, then all we need is the two-point correlation function, or in Fourier space, the power spectrum. The correlations between temperature and isotropies are connected to correlation between primordial curvature perturbations through a transfer function. Therefore, me measuring the former gives an insight uh, into the latter. And according to the most recent Planck results, primordial fluctuations are well described as nearly scale invariant, adiabatic, and nearly Gaussian. While well, this can all be explained by inflation, its microscopic origin remains a mystery. To better understand what uh, produced such fluctuations, what inflationary mechanism generated them, we need to look at higher order correlation functions, uh, namely at non Gaussianity. Now, many theoretical models uh, that agree with observations predict relatively strong non-Gaussian signals. Uh, we know that different physical processes during inflation, mediated, for example, by particles with certain mass and spin characteristics, at the end of inflation will leave distinctive signatures in the non-Gaussian signal, namely in the correlations between the perturbations. So, the study of correlations provide information about the mass and the spin of particles that mediates the primordial interactions. And this uh, is an analog of a particle collider. As you can see on the plot on the left, the peak in energy a resonance signals um, in a collider the presence of a new particle. In the same way, in the plot on the right, you can see that the four point function shows an oscillation, which is um, an oscillation with the frequency given by the mass of new particles in the inflationary background. Here we focus on two kinematical limits of the correlators. The squeeze limit, where a particle mediates interactions between perturbations generated at different times. In other words, with different wavelengths. We also consider the collapse limit, where perturbations sourced at similar times are coupled by mediator, which is produced earlier during inflation. Now, in these limits, the correlation function exhibit, exhibits a scaling which is controlled by the mass of the mediator, as you can see from the formula. So this guy here, delta, is a function of the mass uh, of sigma, which is our mediator. Therefore, a measurement of delta provides spectroscopic information about the initial conditions, as shown in the plot, where we have values of delta in relation to 
um, the physics uh, behind it. Um, a value of delta between zero and three halves signals the presence of a light mediator particle in Hubble units, setting long-range correlations. In particular, delta equals to zero refers to the so-called local non-Gaussianity. Values of delta equal or larger than true instead probe self-interaction of the inflaton and include equilateral non-Gaussianity. So in other words, uh, looking at higher order correlation functions beyond the power spectrum can potentially help us to better understand the early universe, in particular, the inflationary mechanism that produced primordial fluctuations. Then uh, given future experiments and the um, data they're going to provide, it is natural to ask how our constraint on non oceanity going to improve with resolution in the future. Now, um, let's consider a simple scenario where we have an ideal experiment, meaning that it doesn't have noise nor foregrounds, um, and the only um, limit to our measurement is good old cosmic variance. Then uh, if we have and independent samples, the error of the over measurement decreases as the square root of n. In the CMB experiment, n is uh, the number of pixels, which in spherical harmonics is given by the largest multiple you can measure, L max. Here we find that the error decreases with the number of modes, or equivalently, we find that the ratio between the signal and the noise squared is proportional to L max squared. Similarly, for a 3D experiment, uh, we get uh, K max cube, where K max in this case is the Fourier equivalent of the smallest observed scale within the survey. Uh, we, here we can already notice a natural limitation of the CMB a rather trivial one. Indeed, the CMB is a 2D surface and 3D perturbations are projected onto it, which means that uh, there's a loss on the information which is intrinsic to the CMB being a 2D surface. Therefore, the scaling of the signal to noise will be different from the 3D survey scaling. But there is another effect to be taken into consideration. At small scales, free photons traveling from hot to cold spots cause the temperature to be averaged, reducing the anisotropies. This effect is called diffusion or silk dumping. And it can be clearly observed in the tail of the power spectrum shown in the uh, plot. This is the angular power spectrum of temper anisotropies, and you can clearly see that at some point it goes down due to dumping. If we put this in our estimation, then we have a new scaling. Here we immediately notice the presence of n, which is the order of the correlation function. This formula tells us that there is a fundamental and intrinsic limitation in for correlation functions with n larger than four we cannot distinguish signal from noise anymore. And even if we consider the bispectrum, which has n equals to three, the scaling of the signal to noise is so, well is below mode counting, so not very promising. Therefore, there is a significant loss of information due to, of course, projection, but also diffusion dumping. And this loss shows up even if the signal and the noise are equally both dumped. So um, how is it possible and what's the cause of this? Well, um, this last scattering surface has a finite thickness. In this, this illustration highlights the fact that uh, the dumping effect is not 2D, it's, it's actually three-dimensional. It has indeed two components. Uh, uh, sorry, it has three components, two parallel to the surface and one perpendicular to it along the line of sight. Um, 
So in the end, what we actually observe is an average over all possible triangles along the same line of sight. And this effectively blurs the measurement. In other words, it reduces our ability to detect the signal. Um, so far in our estimations, we didn't consider any particular kinematical configuration. But now let's look at the squeeze limit of correlators. Um, here we derive analytically the leading signal to noise scaling with the resolution for all endpoint correlation functions of temperature and isotropies. Here is what we find. Uh, taking back the plot of delta, namely the plot of the mass of the mediator in relation to the scaling of the correlators, we find that uh, the scaling converges to mode counting for values of delta related to a light mediator particle. Um, while other interactions, such as the inflaton self interaction, have a less favorable scaling with the resolution and are therefore less detectable. We also perform a numerical analysis to test our findings, and we do so for the bispectrum. We compute the signal to noise for commonly used shapes, such as the local and the equilateral one, that uh, so I think will sound familiar now because we've seen this in the plot of uh, delta. Um, here we include temperature and polarization and isotropies, which are showed respectively in blue and orange. We also include the combination of the two in green. The slopes indicate the scaling with resolution. Here we find confirmation with the theoretical analysis done so far for both the shapes. Uh, indeed, the local one has a scaling uh, which is in agreement with mode counting, mode counting as expected, while the equilateral shape has a poor scaling. We can also see that uh, polarization is affected by damping as well, but combining temperature and polarization can mitigate the scaling in cases like the equilateral one, where usually it's really poor and we see that there's a clear improvement. Uh, we perform the same analysis for the collapse limit. Uh, again, looking at the plot of delta, um, we see that the scaling grows going towards local shapes. Uh, in particular, at delta, delta equals to zero, it shows a behavior even more favorable than mode counting. More specifically, if we look at the signal to noise of the so-called tau and l spectrum, uh, it scales with the power of four uh, with respect to re re resolution, which is better than the bispectrum. Uh, to test this finding, we perform a numerical analysis of the tau and l spectrum, and indeed find that the um, scaling is what expected from theoretical analysis for both temperature and polarization, which in this case give the same contribution to the signal to noise. Moreover, the combination of temperature and polarization data doesn't provide a significant improvement to the scaling, simply because it's already more than optimal. And we had a similar scenario for the local bispectrum. Overall, from this analysis, we can say that the effect of dumping and projection at small scales is more evident for equilateral configurations. Let's use a more in intuitive argument to understand this finding. As shown in this illustration for the bispectrum, when large scale perturbations are correlated with small ones, then uh, the signal is given by averaging, uh, averaging over triangles with the same shape along the line of sight. So overall, the signal is well-defined and we can recognize it as such. On the other hand, a single co signal coming from the correlation of perturbation with a sm similar but small scale receives contribution from different shapes. Uh, this is due to the thickness of the last scattering surface. 
So in the end, even if the squeeze and kinematic limits can help to mitigate the loss of information, uh, equilateral shapes remain, remain hard to detect. In conclusion, uh, the scaling of the signal to noise with resolution is reduced due to a blurring effect at small scales given by the uh, finite thickness of the large scatter, large, uh, sorry, to the um, last scattering surface. However, in certain kinematical limits uh, that we explored, higher order correlation functions still provide a wealth of information about the early universe physics and are worth exploring. We also show that equilateral shapes are more affected than squeezed ones. And we tested our uh, theoretical analysis with the Fisher forecast, confirming our findings. Here, uh, we show that combining polarization and temperature data can improve the scaling of those spectra that are not already optimal. Um, thank you for watching this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, see you soon at the live discussion with many questions, I hope. Bye.